Harvard Divinity School. Negation, not knowing, and the dark in Brazilian and Cuban Creole forms of religion. February 16th, 2022. Good afternoon and welcome to our first Gnosiologies event for 2022. My name is Giovanna Parmigiani and I'm the host of this series organized within the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative at the CSWR here at Harvard Divinity School. The series focuses on ways of knowing that are often labeled as non-rational, traditionally referred to as gnosis in Western philosophical and religious traditions, and often understood in contraposition to science. These ways of knowing are becoming more and more influential in contemporary societies, popular culture, and academic research. It is with immense pleasure that I introduce our guest, Professor Diana Espirito Santo, who will talk today about her current research on negation, not knowing, and the dark in Brazilian and Cuban Creole forms of religion. She will examine the ambiguous space of paradox from the point of view of two distinct ethnographic sites, Brazil and Cuba, with Umbanda and Creole Espiritismo, respectively. By thinking through an interstitial, in-between, impossible logic, she will point out the gaps in scholarly approaches premised on the notion that knowledge is that to be grasped with the right techniques. Professor Espirito Santo is an associate professor of social anthropology at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. She worked and published extensively on the topics of spirit possession and mediumship in the context of Cuban Espiritismo and Umbanda. I signal just a couple of books that might be particularly interesting for the audience of this series. The 2021 Mattering the Invisible, Technologies, Bodies, and the Realm of the Spectral, a volume edited with Jack Hunter, who also will be um, a host, um, a guest of this um, series later on in the semester, and the 2014 The Social Life of Spirits, edited with Rui Blains. More recently, Professor, Professor Espirito Santo started working on the so-called paranormal, and she has, has a forthcoming book with Rutledge on this topic titled Spirited History, Technologies, Media, and Trauma in Paranormal Chile. So thank you, Diana, for being here, and please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Giovanna. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and thank you for the Harvard Divinity School for having me. Uh, it's a real pleasure and an honor to be the first talk in this interesting series um, of talks. Okay, so can I have my PowerPoint, please? Um, right. So my talk is called Negation, Not Knowing, and the Dark in Brazilian and Cuban Creole Forms of Religion. We can stay with this uh, slide for a little bit. Uh, so this first section is called Anthropology in the Dark. Uh, in Roy Wagner's Coyote Anthropology, published in 2010, a Batesonian Socratic style conversation dialectic with the Coyote, the trickster in Native American cosmologies, Coyote says, there's nothing in the phenomenality of things, but that it is a feature of the names we give them. That is the shamanism of the foregrounded figures that we have learned to perceive in our looking and thinking world. The name does not represent what it refers to, and still some things remain unnameable. The third path in relation to this is what Wagner and Coyote call the vanishing point. I quote, the part that cannot be verbalized no matter how many times you repeat it, end quote. It is a dimensionless point, Wagner says. This paper deals with these fringes of not knowing of the dimensionless in two ethnographic contexts that I know well and have spent years researching, Brazil and Cuba. These contexts have in common an engagement with another world of being. And these are not self-enclosed, neat cosmologies. There are cosmological threads that lead nowhere for the people involved, that open more questions than they answer, and that may cause a stillness of conceptual thinking. While anthropology, my discipline, can self-reflexively understand the extremity of its limitation in, in relation to itself, it has not acknowledged the shadows of the world of, inter, of its interlocutors as well. Bruce Kapfer says that, I quote, the commanding anthropological imagination finds it difficult to conceive of anything concerned with human endeavor that lies outside of human constructional, cultural, and social processes. An implication of this is that one element of, of ongoing social life cannot be abstracted out or separated from the whole. 
but there are corners where no sense rules, where there's nothing to say. Um, no narrative or explanation or logic comes up against the brick wall in the cultures we study, especially our logic. Anthropology deals excessively well with ordered as well as fractured cosmologies where all kinds of inversions and transgressions take place. But there is room for uncertainty, doubt or paradox in conceptual exegesis only as a privative, as something missing on the way to a hypothetically more complete picture, culture or life. Doubt, moreover, perpetual doubt and uncertainty are regarded as either crippling or purposefully, purposefully obfuscating as an effect of sociopolitical and economic disarray, for instance, or of a religious ideology of blind faith and abandonment of objectivity that James Letts argues, I would say wrongly, is also characteristic of the paranormal sciences. What is not known is taken in exactly this sense as ontologically extractive and absence to be added to later, namely filled to fuller knowledge. In other words, there's never any scope for not knowing, for conceptual dissonance or vacuity, nor for profound paradox. These assumptions are highly problematic with spirit possession, Roslinga argues, where what, where what uh, does not get captured is perhaps more relevant than what is. Knowledge is not on a continuum, the opposite of which is not not knowing, argue Kiriakidis and Irvine. In their analysis of two islands, Cyprus and Orkney, the authors examine the idea that magic is experienced ambivalently in the realm of not knowing, and that this enables their interlocutors, I'm quoting, to retain a distance, but also entertain the possibility of magic being real and powerful. Magical knowledge stutters here, they say, citing Deleuze and Guattari, and magical experience presents itself as fragmented and erratic. The idea that spirits are knowable through embodiments or even through participation or skilled interaction is equally premised on the notion that knowledge is somehow there to be grasped with the right means or techniques. But mystical, religious or spiritual experience often does not take the form of gradual immersion or even absorption to sight Lerman or skilled learning <clears throat> Neither is it simply a relational or ontological kind of co-constitution. Sometimes it is fuzzy, interstitial, or even absent by definition. More recent work is illuminating. A recently published edited volume has attempted to grapple with peripheral spaces, positing their generativity for social theory, for methodology. Martinez, Fredrickson, and Pupo argue that their book, Peripheral Methodologies, explores the, way, the ways in which, I quote, the unarticulated, the edgy, and the unknown can be considered a form of thinking about problems, questions, and evidence, which also entails reflecting upon what it means to be on the periphery. They rightly argue that during fieldwork, we encounter phenomena that we cannot understand at the very limits of perception or comprehension. But they ask, what if we resist the urge to extract meaning and assemble fragments into a whole? Vulnerability, feeling lost, not knowing, and staying in the in-between allows for creativity, for finding languages to write the incomplete or invisible. What if gathering data were about the preservation of suspension and surprise, the embrace of not knowing, um, or indeed unlearning, magnifying awareness out of, out of the outer limits or what remains unknown? In his forward to this book, Paul Stoller expresses this through a description of one of his friends and interlocutors, Adam Ojanitongo, who lived close to the dangerous middle, the unknown, the bush, replete with mystery and danger, and by lineage became a sorcerer himself, a Suhansi. Stoller says that Janitongo lives a life filled with what John Keats called negative capability, the capacity to live with incompleteness and contradiction. Stoller tells us of one experience of what he calls it, not knowing your backside from your front side, when he was awoken in the middle of the night at Adam Mujanitongo's house with what seemed to be footsteps and high pitched screeching, followed by the scratching on the corrugated tin door. The screeching now sounded like a child's wail with donkeys braying and dolls, dogs howling in the distance. Adam Musan later told him that he had heard the guardians of the bush. Stahl's response to this, to his own encounter with non-knowledge, um, or the absurd, as an anthropologist, is to remain between art and ethnography, to evoke the remedy of art, to tell a good story while acknowledging, I cite, not knowing, unlearning, 
in the absence of knowledge. For some scholars, these impasses are natural no-goes for anthropology. As Matthias van der Poort suggests, in relation to the phenomenon of possession in Brazilian candomblé, there is something in possession trance that refuses to be signified, not simply for those studying it, but for those experiencing it. He continues, no matter how clever our attempts to break the mystery, something about possession remains enigmatic, unapproachable, resisting the word, uh, displaying the failure of representation. Explanatory cosmological models only go so far, he says, for the possessed. It is a mystery locked up in the here and now of bodily experience, this is what Van de Poort says. The real, he says, quoting Zizek, is something that persists only as failed, missed in a shadow, and dissolves itself as soon as we try to grasp it in its positive nature. The real is paradoxical to the extreme. It disappears as soon as we represent it. It is exterior to all symbolization. Perhaps all we can do as scholars is to study native discourses and actions that vie to protect the really real from outside claims, fake simulations, cultural, cultural appropriations, appropriations, such as is the case with Candomblé. Thus, as Van der Poort claims, we would be seeing an objectification of certain forms of the real. A way out of this representational conundrum, I suggest, is to attempt to understand what people do with the paradox of the negative, what ontological innovations are made possible through its recognition. To speak of the inaccessibility of the real sounds like science fiction. In science fiction, as Eugene Thacker argues in relation to the work of H.P. Lovecraft, there is a proliferation of beings of life that defy description. Take, for example, the Shoggoths or elder things, monsters that in Lovecraft's tales can barely be named or described or even thought. They have material bodies, but no fixed form. And encounters with them occur in a strange, I quote, no place that is neither quite that of the phenomena world of the human subject or the noumenal world of an external reality, somewhere in between. Thacker says these creatures represent the very horizon of human thought, the limits of thought to think life at all. Lovecraft's characters verify this third form of life. He says the threat is not the monster or that which threatens existing categories of knowledge, rather it is the nameless thing. The weird is the life according to the logic of, of an inaccessible real. So in the rest of this paper, I will think the two case studies uh, of Cuba and Brazil through this embrace of impossible logic and argue that paradox here can be thought through, the negative, through negative theology, the medieval counter-orthodox school of thought that gives prominence to negation in a description of God. And it's great that I'm in Harvard Divinity School because you're all going to really criticize me, which is great. Um, so as Sundarajan argues, by denying the possibility to name God, negative theology cuts at the very root of our cognitive makeup, the impulse, human impulse to name and put things in categories. In the ethnographic themes and examples I explore here, I argue that what is not known or not knowable by definition takes shape through extreme forms of self-reflexivity, which encompass encompasses the cosmos itself as a recursive element of this reflexivity. I suggest that to understand how paradoxes are generated, lived or managed, we cannot analytically differentiate between real and imagined realities. Unknowable, ineffable realities perceived at the margins of experience and perception as non-conceptual or as negation are often understood as the very grounding of reality itself. For the interlocutors I discuss in this paper, this place of not knowing speaks a different language altogether, and it is a language of paradox. And now I'm going to go into my first case study, which is Brazilian Umbanda. And I will explain these, um, the, the, the sort of theoretical grounding for negative theology after I, I speak about my Cuban case as well. So Brazilian Umbanda, the first vignettes, um, can you please uh, pass to the other slide? Great. Uh, the first vignette will be about Umbanda, a religion born from an early 20th century middle-class preoccupation with ethnic and racial inclusion and exclusion. It is conceived by early scholars of Afro-Brazilian religion, such as Bastide and Ortiz, um, as Brazil's first national religion. 
Wonders cosmology uh, is a vast web of entidades that correspond to entities that correspond to and are classified under the lines of the Orishas, the Afro-Brazilian gods of Candomblé, and its affine religions through Brazil, throughout Brazil. The normative cosmological format is of seven lines of entities, each headed by two Orishas, such as Oxalá, Oxum, Oxóssi, Xangô, Ovaluayê, Naná, and Yemanjá. Within these lines are the specific lines which evoke a series of characters seen as formative Brazil's identity. The crianças, the children, caboclos, the Native American spirits of Umbanda, the pretos velhos, the elderly African slave spirits, Pomba Gira, an agglomerated archetypal figure of a prostitute, as well as spirit characters under the category of o povo da rua, the people of the streets, which for me are the most fascinating. Other spirit kinds are boiaderos, cattle herders, marineros, stranded sailors, and gypsies. Umbanda possession rites are called giras and are usually dedicated to one kind of spirit entity. Can you pass the slide, please? But as I have argued elsewhere, mediums here do not just absorb and represent figures of Brazilian history in their bodies. Possession trance, known through the active term of incorporation, incorporação, instantiates cosmology in its very act. Spirits become particulars of other spirits, gaining shape as they occur in people's bodies and lives. In the predominant semi-conscious trance that results from processes of incorporation, the paradoxical work of the self involves both excessive self-awareness and excessive self-forgetting. Or in other words, an awareness in forgetting in what is a fine line of staying with the spirit, keeping it in one's body. This is the paradox, I think, here at the heart of the mind. When Sara was 15, she began to experience what in Candomblé, uh, the most well-known Afro-Brazilian religion, uh, calls bolar no santo, act of uncontrolled possession, which made her sick and pass out every time. Her older sister had begun to work in a tejero de Umbanda, an Umbanda temple, from an early age, and begged her to accept her fate as a medium. But Sara was resistant. It was not until much later on, when her sister moved back to her town, to her house and set up an altar in her room that something was unleashed. Her gypsy spirit came in her sister's body, claiming her. Eventually, she learned, she, Sada, learned the movement through which she could come in her body, a movement of the arms upwards. And since then, Sada and her husband, Miguel, have been mediums exclusively of gypsy spirits. But neither mediumship nor spirit is the same in different bodies. She says they maintain strong resemblances, but they differ. She also uh, talks of this process as coffee with milk, which is um, extremely also revealing of sort of Brazil's logics of racialization as well. Uh, so they maintain strong resemblances, but they differ. It depends on how their energy is coming to you, on how it's allowed to come. That depends on your own energy. Proof of this was the entirely different characteristics of her cigana, her gypsy spirit in her sister's body, which is patently aggressive, uh, and in hers, in which she was not aggressive. There has to be a conscious element in Cigano incorporation. Sometimes this transition point is so subtle that it is barely noticeable. I raise my arms up in the air and I sway my hips and then she comes. And then I feel myself dancing magnificently. I just, I try to keep it up, which of course I can't. What I feel happening and what really happens are two completely different things. The downside of this, she says, is watching yourself on playback in a recording of a possession ceremony when you realize you haven't actually done half of what you felt that you were doing. So she says, when you first incorporate, it takes a while for you to be able to open your eyes. Then little by little you do, and eventually you talk. You're going to speak and not be heard. And that's what it feels like, like you're talking, but no one is listening to you. Some people compare the sensation to what happens when you die. The medium doesn't know what's going on, but he thinks he's the one pulling the strings and it's not anymore. Because it's like I say, he doesn't leave his body, the medium. He still has consciousness. Some people more, some people less. But you think it's you there. And it's not anymore. At least it's not only you. The beginning stages of developing skills for trance are the most confusing for most mediums. In Umbanda, this is notable exactly because most incorporation is not unconscious. Pilar was a young medium I met in Rio de Janeiro in 2011. She was articulate, self-reflexive, she had a master's in anthropology, and she's fully conscious of the contradictions of trance itself. Um, and Pilar told me about a turbulent journey as an Umbanda medium. 
So she has an entity that comes, that has come in her a few times, a kabukla, and notes that what is special about her is that when she incorporates one of her hands, turns into, into a butterfly fluttering in the air. Uh, she cleans the ambience with this gesture. Once she came in her so strongly that her whole body began to shake convulsively, or compulsively. I never asked her for a name and, or, or where she comes from. Some of my other spirits were easier to identify, but this one was always so ephemeral. I felt that if I forced her to speak, she would dissipate in the, with the wind and I would never feel her again. This fragility so, is evident also at the heart of Umbanda temples, as temple leaders struggled to firm, firmar, the entities in mediums' bodies. Pilar says that spirits are not things, they are influences. They gel with mediums. Incorporation is not substitution, both are there. To let these influences flow through you, I'm now studying Pilar, you need to, to concentrate on what's happening, but at the same time, try not to think too hard about yourself. It's a balancing act of awareness and at the same time of self-forgetting. When we develop an Umbanda, this balance is the skill we're learning. But what goes wrong or what remains incoherent or in friction is almost as revealing as what goes right. At the time I met her, Pilar was contemplating whether to stay at, um, at the Umbanda temple she was at, at the time or to leave. Before finding her way there, Pilar had been to two of the temples that had retrograded her development, leaving her seriously ill. The leader of one of the temples, um, the leader of the current temples, sorry, Donna Clara, was a strong willed traditional Afro Brazilian woman with clear prerogatives for both training and discipline. Pilar had rebooted, as she described, but she had begun to incorporate a Preta Vega, an elderly female slave spirit who debilitated her physically. British fellows walk on canes, their backs bent forward, spines pulled, legs shaking. Pilar has premature arthritis and found that, that fixing her Preta Vega, keeping her from coming and going was physically challenging. But it was not just this. Dona Clara told Pilar not to try and exert control, to be passive, not to think too much. First, from that initial state of torpor a medium gets when she begins, to the almost imperceptible vibrations on the legs, to the feeling that something comes and stays with you. Pilar says that soon you can sit on a stool, kneel before the altar, ask for the chief spirit's blessing. Your gestures become more solidly theirs, and soon you, be, you start being able to surrender your voice. And that voice begins to ask for things, a glass of water, bitter coffee, a pipe. But then at other times, Umbanda's culture became explicitly conscious and difficult to set aside. Pilar experienced clear oscillations in consciousness that she described as unproductive for the setting. She began to get in her own way. Tobacco was the first point of friction. Pilar had never smoked and British Welsh consult while puffing on a, smoke, on a, on a pipe. Dona Clara would insist that her British Vela smoke but Pilar felt that her entity had never wanted it in the first place. She says, I got the feeling that many of the items used in Umbanda are not for the spirits, but for the mediums. They are our crutches. What I felt was more or less this. At the religious center, I'm, I'm being taught what gestures to carry through with the impulse that I receive from my spirit. For a while I thought I did this well. There were some things that I thought were genuine impulses from the Brita Vela. Um, for instance, she blessed the air when she came. That wasn't me. That was her. It wasn't scripted. But there were others, the kneeling, the asking for the chief's blessing, the smoking that I perceived to be more forced, more me. So we have in both of these examples, magnified processes of the interstitiality or in-betweenness of self in Sada's description of trance and the nefarious consequences of too much self-consciousness in processes of incorporation. There is an aconceptual zone where the medium both is and is not, uh, where there's a transformation of not knowing into the complex and action uh, of a cosmology, which is at once linear and non-linear, both representational and recursive, and both knowable and ultimately beyond knowledge. It is a cosmology and potential that is at stake in the end. What lies on the other side is ultimately inscrutable, undefinable in categorical terms. The idea that, that among many young practitioners, Ubanda's entities are vibrations that can divide infinitely rather than, rather than disincarnate souls with particular lives and deaths makes this ineffability more pronounced. For some, the names of the entities are just labels created by the formalization of the work and used by the entities themselves. So my next example is Spiritismo Criollo Cubano. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you have to pass all the way through to following ones. These are 
yeah, this here, stay here. So the second vignette refers to the Afro-Cuban religious cosmos where spirit metamorphosis is a usual occurrence. Spirits, even one's own, always retain the capacity to become other to themselves, to transform. This ontological transformational precept is primary to the spirit's biography itself. Cuban Creole Espiritismo, a practice that inherits its concerns from both 19th century French spiritism and an Afro-Cuban emphasis on the material here and now, turns on the idea that every person has a unique set of protective spirits, the cordon espiritual, uh, which are present since birth and which can exhibit an infinite amount of identities. These spirits come as African, Indian, Arab, Gypsy, or European spirits most commonly, but can assume any shape from spirits of nuns and priests to casino owners of the 1940s and, and also Chinese laborers, basically a whole constellation of identities that have, that have conformed uh, Cuba's historical uh, demography, demographic. Um, so Cuban spiritist theories of selfhood are therefore based on a simple principle that the person is composed of both visible and invisible components with corresponding consequences for understandings of causality. But if there is a circumscription of spirits to the medium self, these wider selves are also systems in perpetual motion and transformation. They move outwards uh, towards events, accidents, characteristics only they have access to, only they can see. These non-selves are always a step ahead. They exist in the in-between, in the darkness of categories. And so are ultimately unconceptualizable, even as they pull their medium selves into this abyss. Psychological and spiritual truths here are aspects of one uh, and the same metamorphic phenomena with spirits having vir the virtual potential to deconstruct and reconstruct selves, creating an endless variety of forms of themselves with corollaries for their medium's understanding of themselves, of course. Um, and, but there's always a dark or blind spot, a place where no explanation or description holds. Uh, in African religion, in which I include cruel versions of Spiritismo, we are thus all born with protective dead, muertos. But it is not always obvious who they are in the first place. This lack of spirit biographical specifics is in fact an entry point into Cuban Spiritismo's logics of negation. While mediums regularly refer to the physical and psychological characteristics of their muertos, their skin color and build, if the spirits walk with the gates, if they had subservient suffered lives, what personalities they have. I have actually met very few spiritistas that were able to give historically or biographically accurate and detailed descriptions or depictions of the spirits. As Christina Wirtz says, spirit biographies are necessarily fragmentary, mysterious, and even obfuscating rather than fully revealing or coherent. I have argued elsewhere that there's a pervasive notion of ontological fluidity, or plasticity that subverts the near readings of who the spirits are, which collapses psychology with, on, with uh, cosmology. We can start with the notion of desdoble, which translates to something unfolded, a metamorphosis of certain spirit shapes and identities into others. This can be seen, for instance, in an African entity observed by the medium's extra perceptual apparatuses into an Arab one, or a Native American Indian uh, reforming itself into a European one. <clears throat> the shift in presentation, which may also include manifesting as older uh, or younger versions of themselves, are routine in Mises Spiritualis, Spiritismo's main mediumship rites. That spirit can contain several versions of itself, perhaps infinite ones embedded virtually in their constitution, is explained in multiple ways, including that they are past lives, reincarnations, made available as skins for manifestation. Mortals can also mutate into different versions of themselves through shared symbols in the Afro-Cuban cosmos. For instance, there's a Santeria uh, and Catholicism and to a certain extent, Palo Monte, which is another Afro-Cuban religion. A spirit that presents itself as a crippled old man draped in a purple cape and followed by dogs is projecting itself as a version of San Lazaro, St. Lazarus, associated in Santeria with Baba Loaye, the god of plague, illness, and cures. A gitana, or a gypsy spirit that comes dressed in yellow, the color of the love goddess Ochun, projects a symbol of love, perhaps romance. So these associations to Santeria, and to some extent Palomonte, are called corrientes, currents, and by themselves are understood as messages to the mediums or participants. In the case of the San Lázaro spirit, perhaps a warning of impending sickness or healing, and in the case of the Gitana, a foreshadowing of future or present love processes. Excellent. 
In any case, as is obvious, both the disdoble and the corriente phenomena are not thought to be arbitrary, but imminently linked to the recipient of the message, usually the person whose spirits they are. These differential spirit aesthetics reflect a need for corresponding, for corresponding shift in human behavior or knowledge, and either incite or accompany this person's own spiritual evolution, so to speak. But even this cosmologically inherent capacity for metamorphosis questions the limits of human knowledge. Once in a misa I attended, uh, namely for the ritual identification of the spirits of, fran, of, of friends, mediums were, were at a loss as to how to explain why Fran had a spirit, an African spirit who was both a man and his wife. It was as if a single entity took turns appearing as both ends of a past relationship, oscillating on the spiritual stage. This encompassment of relations in a single spirit manifestation is even more baffling than entities who transform themselves according to their reincarnations as people from different epochs. Uh, Marta, an elderly medium I interviewed, vouches for the fact that you can fall into trance with your own past lives. So what are muertos then? We, uh, we could ask in, in all this you know, soup of uh, possibilities. The collective conceptualization of the muerto itself in Cuba is almost purposely vague and with some complaints. So Guzman, um, the practitioner of Santeria and Espiritismo, laments that mediums always have the same descriptions of African spirits. For instance, they're typically named Francisca, Ta Jose, uh, or there are others such as La Gitana or, or El Indio, right? So the African character always comes with an axe, he says, and his pants rolled up to his knees and with no shoes. The Congos, in particular, are seen as temperamental and brute, associated with witchcraft and magic. I'm not going to get into the racial aspect of this whole thing. For Guzman, these identities have become so archetypal that no one diverges from them. The Gitanas are attractive and flirtatious, and the Indios, a category that includes both indigenous Caribbean peoples and Native Americans are associated with batter and valor. For Guzman, these larger figures are components of what he calls the mental atmosphere of Cuba. They are not individual muertos who have lived and died. They're more like the Orishas, the deities of the Afro-Cuban Afro religious sphere. Right? So the road is long and uncertain for those who want knowledge on their spirits. And it involves a careful exploration of aspects of one's own personality uh, that may converge with those of one's muertos. These convergences are the only clues. Yet there's something even less out of the medium's conceptual grasp in relation to their mortis. It is not just that on manifesting through symbols of a commission of spirits, and there are many commissions, including the medical commission or the African commission, they are summoning up the power of the collective, as well as any potential spirit in it for the effect of their mission. It is also that for some mediums, it is that muertos can only appear through what is expected for those, from, from those who see them. For one of my oldest interlocutors, Eduardo, a practitioner of Spiritismo, Paulo Monte Santeria, he's also a practitioner of Paulo Monte Santeria, the spirit must be conceivable by the mediums that apprehend it, that see it. But you can only see what we expect to see. As such, it, may, it must appear under the guise of an identity that is possible within a certain conceptual cultural cosmos. He appropriates Jung's theory of the collective unconscious to, po to point to the pool of possibilities that are available to the spirit's physical appearance to the mediums. Spirits, in effect, appear as cultural languages of, a, of the particular geographical space in which they're summoned to work. But this is also because mediums project these idioms in manifestation, which in the case of Cuba are archetypes, such as el africano, la gitana, el indio, and so on. Spiritista mediums basically work with this as if identity makeup among others, among other things, in order to develop and strengthen their own spiritual constitutions. But the question of the real, even among the most studious of mediums, such as Eduardo, is ultimately inaccessible. It is in this expanding cosmos that the idea of the inconceivable or indescribable is implicit, as one Indio spirit sings. Um, Yo tengo un indio que se viste de Congo. I have an indio who dresses as Congo. Yo tengo un Congo que se viste de indio. I have a Congo who dresses in, as indio. Echa pa'lante, echa pa allá. Go forward, go forth. Llegaron los indios, se acará, se acará. The indios have arrived, and se acará is a, is, is a sound they make. Ya vienen los congos, and with them come the congos. Okay, so uh, a discussion with negative theology. <laughs> 
mind, self, and other in the two examples I gave simply do not behave as cognitive or social psychologists expect. Anthropologist Catherine Ewing has famously argued that a single model of self or person is not adequate for describing how selves are experienced or represented in any culture. There's no one concept that is applicable in any cultural space. Indeed, if we look at the importance of the unconscious, we could observe, as, as Douglas Holland has, that self-awareness is not seamless or coherent, but rather is able to embrace interpsychic conflict, unconscious divisions within the self, repressions and hidden traumas or desires. What is not explicitly known here can take on immeasurable importance. Be this not known categories of experience and affect that are hypocognized in a given environment, or not me's, which have been pushed into the shadows unacknowledged. But we can question whether the self is radical enough, even if even in its fragmentation, whether it is other enough. Indeed, self, both in Brazilian Umbanda and Cuban Spiritismo, behaves very much like parapsychologists envision the phenomena of psi, the unknown factor in extrasensory perception, as a process that violates basic natural laws. Hansen cites some of, of some of what uh, what some of these are. I, I quote: "An event cannot precede its cause." A person's mind cannot directly affect the material world except the nervous system. Mental life depends on the brain. We obtain knowledge from the world only through the senses. Minds, selves, and bodies behave in fundamentally anti-structural ways in the two ethnographies I've described. <clears throat> I suggest that one way to grasp this is to look at theological negation as inspiration. Negation here signals the limits of thought. In this case, not simply of cosmological knowledge and imagination, but of bodily access to it in the first place. There's an ineffability felt at the very margins of bodily experience. <clears throat> it is an irretrievable horizon, one that can never really be reached, but that is at the same time worked somehow into cosmology, cosmology that works. To speak of the dark, let me have some tea before I go into negative theology. To speak of the dark, is not necessarily to speak of literal darkness. Pseudo Dionysius of Areopagite, or Dennis, an unorthodox thinker that has become associated with the founding of the apophatic tradition, negative theology, was to exert enormous influence on medieval European Christian philosophy. He posited that God cannot be, uh, and here I'm citing Kid, completely or com comprehensively captured by concepts and language for the reason that these apply to beings, discrete limited entities and not to pure being itself, abundant manifold, which Dennis identified with God. According to Dionysius, however, because we are immersed in beings that we describe with concepts, we can draw from scripture for words and conceptions with which to seek divinity. These may include father, son, or wisdom. But while the contemplation of these names might allow one to approach God, it is in the recognition that he can never be known in his entirety. Nepra says that the expression of an inexpressibility seems to require at least some measure of rural resistance, hyperbole, linguistic creativity. He notices how Dennis uh, sometimes uses hyper prefixes, for instance, hyper being, hyper God, hyper good, which at the same time removes God from the picture because the standard translation from Greek hyper is beyond. He also, he also, he also uses negation as a standard rhetorical technique, giving birth to the term negative theology. Furthermore, he employs conflictive visual and spatial metaphors, such as that God dwells in luminous darkness, darkness so dark that it is paradoxically brilliant, light so brilliant that it is paradoxically dark. A spatial metaphor would be God's dwelling as a divine mountain, the apex of which is enshrouded in luminous darkness, one that invites the climb, but once ascended, enshrouds in profound unknowing. So in order to invoke an experience of the uncategorizable then, one needs to exercise a non-conceptual kind of consciousness, while at the same time relying on one's own vocabulary. Further, <clears throat> nothing or negation here is not necessarily equivalent to nothing. For Meister Eckhart, a German medieval mystical theologian, God was referred to as Godhead, an enigmatic figure inaccessible to us. If I use Eugene Thacker's understanding of Eckhart. Eckhart's nothing is not privative, if defined by absence. Thacker begins his analysis of Eckhart's project of divine mediation in Sermon 19 in a passage that is, Paul rose from the ground with eyes open and saw nothing. Um, Thacker says Eckhart elaborates different senses of the term nothing. 
not sure if I have time to go. Yeah, maybe I do, maybe I don't. Yeah, I'll go through. He summarizes the first sense of the term nothing in the following way. He saw nothing that is God. God is a nothing and God is a something. What is something is also nothing. The first sense is the most elaborate in that it deals with the philosophical notion of God as nothing, but a nothing that is at the same time not simple, negative, or privative. It is a notion of the divine in terms of a nothing that has little to do with any ontological notion of nothing. Um, there's no mystical experience in the sense of having an experience of or of containing something substantial that builds one up. Instead, there is a self-abnegation or releasement of the subject in which one finds a nothing that is like finding God. I cut a few of the sentences here. If God is beyond being, then he is both nothing and something, nameless, with no attributes or properties. The divine is thought of in terms of contradiction or paradox. We find echoes of this in both the Brazilian and the Cuban ethnographies, in the sense of the very limit of framing and knowing an entity, at least from the point of view of a formed and forming self. Rather, in Brazilian Umbanda, self must be abnegated, relinquished in order to apprehend other, but also fully acknowledged. And in Cuba, the, the nothing could refer to the infinity of possibilities that are not amenable to human cognizance. Um, they signal both everything and nothing at once in their inaccessibility and in their full potentiality as well. Further, like Pseudo Dionysius, in both places, there are as if languages of description recognized as limited and arbitrary in a categorization of spirits, but necessary nevertheless. Some of these languages are more paradoxical than others, particularly those that are static, archetypal, that clearly indicate that an unknown something is availing itself of that cultural mask. Still, there is a path to be painstakingly made in each one of those cases. We could cite the example of Rusbrick, a Dutch mystic who posits a wayless abyss, abyss sorry, a, pass, a path without a path, that is both expressed in the sense of being lost and in the sense of fathomless depth. Um, for Rusbrick, this mystical itinerary led to self-negation, darkness, but also the appreciation of divine beatitude. This is also Thacker. There's a fullness of divine union in Rusbrick that comes with the first recognition of inaccessibility. Phyllis Mazzocchi uh, has also used the metaphor of the wanderer to frame some of these dynamics. The non-conceptual realm of the imaginal, she says, is a liminal one that continually constellates paradoxes. It is chaotic, uncertain, uncertain, what medieval alchemists and mystics would call a dark void. Um, the wonder bestrides the threshold between what is and what is not, existent, nameable, clean, sacred, the potentiality of the liminal space between. In both the Brazilian and the Cuban case, the wonder is also ultimately the creator of cosmology through this movement. So this paper regards the states of paradox at the edge of the real or inside the dimensionless point, to cite Wagner, as generative of cosmology itself, as cosmogonic. This is not just about psyche or mind, about finding roots to stillness or immediacy within oneself. It's about the creation of ontology, be it expressed as spirits, gods, ancestors, or living people themselves and their materialities. So this vitalist expansionist dimension of religious thought and action has not been taken into account by scholars who have, who have looked at paradox as religious motivation or inspiration. Um, in, in his book, The Uses of Paradox, for instance, Matthew Bagger argues for the notion that a tolerance for paradox, I'm almost finished, uh, in religion comes with a consideration of the social attitudes that the believer has in relation to his group. So he says, paradox will horrify and offend a religious thinker fearful for the external boundary of his or her group. Conversely, a thinker concerned to bring outsiders into his group or her group will feel awe and reverence for paradox and view it as a sacred mediator. Magger explains that the cognitive dissonance, a theory devised by psychologist Leon Festinger to account for psych the psychology of change when two beliefs are dissonant, is often the main component of paradoxical statements such as cones, paradoxical anecdotes in Zen Buddhism to demonstrate the limits of reason, or as mentioned by Bagger, um, Kunyan, contradictory statements frequently assigned to students in Chan uh, Buddhism. But Bagger also argues that Kierkegaard, among others, treats negativity as the motive force of individual inward deepening. The negative moves an individual in increasing your inwardness to the religious spheres, the deepest, most inward sphere of existence. <laughs>
Thus, for Kierkegaard, contradiction must be appropriated, not resolved. Proper religious disposition can only come about by an ineradicable dissonance. Language is, of course, the primary means to which to, to express the ineffable, the negative. We can see this clearly in Pseudo Dionysius' uh, in, inauguration of mystical reflection. But Bagger's stance on paradox does not take into consideration other more active, even material aspects of reflecting, ones with potentially cosmologically creative nature. The two case studies here demonstrate the nature of the paradoxical imagination uh, made concrete, manifest through the cultivation and materialization of spirit entities. The first one sees this, ne this negotiation of the dark taking place in relation to trance in Brazilian Umbanda to a consciousness that must be trained to walk the line between the dark, the all-encompassing cosmos of entities, the non-nameable, and their earthly bodily shapes. And the second delves into the appropriation of darkness in Cuban Espiritismo and Afro-Cuban religion. This is not simply about a self that unfolding itself in myriad, myriad spirits who themselves unfold and transforms into others necessarily cannot know its limits. It is about an eminently creative self. Um, perhaps there are ways to conceptualize this, to conceptualize this and, and let me try here um, through negative theology. So apophysis, according to Catherine Keller, remits us to a cloud of the impossible, of unknowing, which reveals in turn in uncertainty as possibility. She says, one may read in the Dionysian um, exercise of deconstructive negation, rather than the binary dialectic or the triumph of the third way, the mystic third space of unfinished, indeed boundless exercise in self transformation. Not a neat nile of names, but a chaotic multiplicity and overflow in excess. This makes sense. Keller further mentions Nicholas de Cusa, another apophatic thinker, for whom there is a paradox uh, of representing a transcendent creator when he does not stand outside this very creation, where he is of it. It is an, an infolding and uh, unfolding God in a cosmos of interrelations where they, these are seeped in possibility, quantum-like. In, in my opinion, both of my case studies also imply this double movement of an infoldment and unfolding. And here I stop, even though I had a conclusion where I was, where I was mentioning Jeffrey Cripple. Thank you so much, uh, Diana, for this um, um, the lecture of yours. I was really looking forward, actually, to to hear your conclusions. But you, you know, <laughs> you just mentioned that um, you wanted to add something from Jess Kripal. Yeah. So my conclusion is about how um, Jeffrey Kripal in in this in this uh, incredible book called The Flip, um, which is basically a, a kind of a continuation and synthesis of other books, including Authors of the Impossible, which is like my favorite book in the world. Um, he basically says that there is, because this deeper ground of being is, is before and beyond all mental or material form and is neither mental nor material, it cannot speak in human language or even in mathematics. It is of an entirely different order. And, it's, and, and so it speaks to us in the only way it can in super strange images. Um, often paradoxes and bizarre and absurd narratives. I don't think my, my fieldwork has to do necessarily with bizarre and absurd narratives, but certainly with the, with the limits of, um, of knowledge as it is, and, and not knowledge in the sense of the opposite of which is uh, non-knowledge, but knowledge in the sense that there's sort of a, a darkness that sort of enfolds and outfolds in a continual sense, and which also materializes as kind of a, kind of a world for the people involved. Um, and I, I like this, uh, this stance of this, this, this paradoxical uh, methodology which he, which he takes when he, when, he, when he does his reading of, of these classic um, paranormal experts like Fred Myers uh, or Jacques Vallée, where it's the text itself that basically in, enfolds the, the paranormal and, and that basically becomes the zone of, um, the zone of, of of, of apparition in a sense. Um, I find that super fascinating uh, because it's not symbolic and it's not non-symbolic. It's somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's what I, yeah, that's what I find fascinating also uh, in terms of my new work on ufology. 
Well, that's fascinating. I think that you're troubling our um, thinking about knowledge and not knowledge on a continuum. It's really very promising and generative. Um, before moving to the questions of the audience that I encourage to, um, uh, to, to read the, the questions on the Q&A function, um, just a basic question, since not all the audience of this nosiology series is uh, academic or has an anthropological background. You briefly mentioned um, on how the notion of spirit possession and mediumship troubles our ideas of mind, self, person, and bodies. Do you want to say a little bit more um, with the, this idea in mind that not all of us are academics um, and some are students and some are students at heart. And um, I think it's a very important point to better understand the, the, the whole lecture of yours. I mean, I mean, I think that the heart of my lecture, as much as it is, you know, not knowing and, and the darkness and what people do with the darkness, it's actually self and the kind of generative uh, movements of self in, in the world. And this idea that we are these self-encapsulated uh, cells inside these bodies um, is, uh, is completely dualistic. And you see this, well, you can see this in experiment with these ideas in spirit possession, where self is actually put very much in question in the sense of, um, in the sense that possession sort of strides a line between, between being and not being, um, but also it's paradoxical as well. So there is, uh, there is spirit, that person is both in and outside their social uh, milieu, right? Um, so if we look at it, for instance, in relation to an image, we could think of, I don't know, the Mobius strip, um, the Mobius strip is sort of a, a strip where it's, where it's possible to move from the inside of, of a strip to, to its outside in a seamless form without crossing a boundary, without making sort of a, a deciding line. Um, and that could be a, a super way to think about possessions and also about self in the sense that we are always informing and informed by the world um, and in possession as well. In possession, there is, of course, there are these uh, what Newman would call catastrophic points. Um, and I talk about this, well, we talk about this in, in a book that I, that, I, um, that I edited with a colleague, Natan Shapiro, they call the dynamic cosmos, um, where, where we move from the inside to the outside, but also from the outside to the inside. Um, so in, in, in Cuba, this, this, uh, this catastrophic point could be, for instance, the materialization of and entities, right? And the materialization of entities through dolls or, th or through religious materiality, which then also has an effect on yourself and not yourself encased in a body, yourself as an expanded being in the world in terms of, you could think of Bateson's mind, right? This sort of system of, 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 of expanding uh, causality in the world. And in Brazil, perhaps this catastrophic point could be um, the loss of oneself, the loss and also the regaining of oneself in terms of possession, because in, in terms of the trans experience, because even though you need to be losing yourself, losing your self consciousness, you also, to be, you also need to be self conscious of the fact that you can't be self conscious. And also, the entity needs to have you as a sort of pillar to, to manifest, not just in your body, but also in relation to the kinds of um, characteristics it brings forth. So there is all kinds of paradoxes involved there. Um, I'm not sure if I'm simplifying this, but I, I think that I can, we can deconstruct self and we can deconstruct possession, but they're both basically two sides of, the, of a similar coin. I think it, that's very well put, actually. Uh, I, tend to always, I tend always to say to my students that we tend to understand self personhood and individual as overlapping, but the, the reality is that things are much more complicated and spirit possession. Thinking about spirit possession in the way you just said, I think it's very useful to deconstruct our ideas and experience of the boundaries of ourselves. Um, so thank you very much for doing this um, uh, clarification. Uh, I also have a question. Um, how much in your understanding of knowledge is language and um, expression important? Um, what's the role of language and, and you know, thinking verbally and being able to communicate. Use, you use ineffable 
uh, several times to gesture towards what you are currently looking at. And so um, can you talk a little bit more about this? I mean, language is absolutely important for, for all uh, religion, religions in the Afro-American world. Uh, language in relation to what you what you chant uh, during songs, what, what kinds of uh, pronunciations you make uh, in order to make a ritual efficacious, all of these things are, um, are language based. It's not just action, it's not just thought, it's language, it's language, it's there to demarcate, to name things, right? Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, I think the flip side of this is that, yes, there is a sort of demarcation of the world. You are now a Baba Lao, right? This would be what Martin Holbrett has this, uh, the idea of uh, infinition, um, uh, inventive definition of a, of, of a person. You invent new things as you pronounce them. And I think that that completely makes sense. But I think, I think um, the flip side of that, and I think this is also relevant, in, at least in some circles, um, is that language is a kind of a, not a crutch, but it kind of a mask for, for, for things which are clearly beyond language. So if you want to, I mean, you don't have anything else but language. So, but language is also a visual language. You see the Indio, you, you chant to Indios. This is what you do. Um, if you chant to uh, gypsy spirits, they may appear. So language is, is a motivator for, for the spirit world. Um, and it is also a solidifier of, of certain uh, ontological properties in that world. So that's in that sense, language is, is extremely important. But I think language here can also, if reflexively language can also be something which can be deconstructed because clearly if you know, like Eduardo, my, my main interlocutor, um, what you chant or what you sing or what you say uh, and how you see what you say uh, is specific to a cultural manifestation, to a cultural form, to a culture, um, then you know that's also limited. You know that there's something perhaps beyond that. Um, and, and, and I've always been very interested in um, the trickster elements of, of cosmologies and shapeshifters and things like uh, you know, tricksters, issues, for instance. Um, and this is, I think, what issues um, teach us, that things are always in, in constant uh, flow and a constant continual transformation. Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for offering us this generative perspective and framework in order to understand uh, spirit possession, uh, mediumship uh, and beyond, I would say. I think it's time to wrap up now. Um, thank you again for your participation and wonderful talk. And thank you all for having been with us. Please stay tuned on the activities of the CSWR, the Transcendence and Transformation Initiative and of Nauseologies. And you can find all this information on the CSWR website that you can find in the chat, including the registration link for our next Nauseologies event that will be next week. I will have a conversation with Professor Elizabeth Perez on gut and other knowledges and religions of the African diaspora. So thanks again and have a have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you very much, Thank you, so much. Thank you all who attended. Thanks. Sponsor, Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2022, the President and Fellows of Harvard College.